Let us close our eyes for a moment. And let's thank the Lord for this time He has given us. Given us in His presence to acknowledge Him as our God. To acknowledge His presence among us, with us, and in us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father God, we want to praise you and thank you. Thank you for your love, Father. Thank you for gathering us here. It's your love that has drawn us to this place. Your word says, when two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in our midst. And this evening, we want to acknowledge your presence among us. We want to acknowledge, Lord, that you are supreme in our life. That everything that we are right now is because of your goodness to us. And today, as you speak to us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, what true worship really is. We ask you, Father, through the power of your Spirit, to make this teaching for us simple, easy to understand, practical to apply in our day-to-day -day life. Father, at this very moment, as you anoint my heart, my lips, my vocal cords, nothing of me, everything of you, let every word that comes forth from my lips fall on the good soil of the hearts of these precious brothers and sisters. And Father, as you speak to us, I bind every spirit of unbelief, every spirit of disturbance and distraction, so that this word that you're going to speak to us can fall on the good soil of our hearts and produce the harvest of your kingdom in each of our lives. We praise you, we thank you, we bless you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Can I request you all to be here because it will be easy for us to have a look at the screen. Please do come this side. We are few in number. So we can actually, you know, have a look at the screen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my dear sisters. Praise God. Praise God. So today, I'm, let's all be seated. Sorry, I, I forgot to tell you to sit down. Please be seated. Praise God. Praise God. So today, I'm going to speak to you on a topic which many of us are familiar with, but probably we have not understood this topic in its entirety. So my topic today is on what is true worship. So before I even start this topic, let me ask you all, what do you understand by worship? Anyone? I've got permission from Father Alfred to let you speak. Because normally in, in church we are not supposed to speak. Only the priest and the one who's here is supposed to speak. You are only supposed to listen. But today I've got special permission from Father Alfred. He's right behind. He says, go ahead. You can speak today. So what is worship according to you? Anybody? Are we all worshippers? Yes, we are. So what is the meaning of worship? And again, there is no wrong answer, no right answer, it's your answer. So what, according to you, is worship? My sister Anne? When we worship, the Holy Spirit can lift up more. When we start singing praise and worship, and uh, the Holy Spirit will increase, and then our spirit will lift up. Okay. So when we, when we sing, the, 
the Holy Spirit will come and will lift up our praise and worship to the Lord. All right, very good, sister. Would you like to answer that? Praise. To give praise, to give worship, to adore. Okay, to give praise, to give worship, to adore. Very good, to sister. To take time to connect with the Lord. To connect with the Lord. Beautiful. 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 Anybody else? So what about you? Yeah, I'll come there. Praise God. Uh, worship is a means of adoration to God. Is an adoration to God. Means is a means of adoration. Is a means of adoration to God. To adore God. So you adore God, you can adore God through worship. All right, beautiful, beautiful. Can we have some response this side? Sister, what about you? Praising, praising, singing, um, meditation. Praising, worshipping, singing, meditation. What about you, brother? Okay, okay. All right, so each one of us has got our understanding of worship as praising, thanking, singing, meditating, and connecting. That's what's beautiful. But let us go to the scriptures today and let us see what St. Paul writing to the Romans says is worship. So let's go to Romans chapter 12. Arisri. Romans chapter 12. And verse number 2. Okay. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Quickly. Praise God. Thank you Jesus. Okay. Verse number 1. You can go to verse number 1 and 2. Praise God. Okay, let's look at this. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Has anyone heard that definition before? St. Paul writing to the Romans is saying, he's appealing to them and he's saying, because of the mercies of God, he's appealing to the people, to the Romans and to you and me today, because of the mercies of God, offer what? Your songs, your candles, your flowers, your incense, what is he talking about? Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now look at this, my dear brothers and sisters. Every time when we gather together in church, why do we gather together in church? To offer God worship. Is that right? Now you're here today for what? To offer worship to God? We have come to praise, we have come to sing, we have come to connect. We have come to glorify God. We have come to praise our hands and praise Him and sing hallelujah. Is that right? But when you look at this particular understanding of the Holy Spirit, what St. Paul writes, worship is not an activity. Worship is not an activity. Worship is a lifestyle. Are you with me? I can come to church, offer God worship, praises, thanksgiving, songs of praise, play the guitar, sing in harmony, 
have a wonderful church choir and I can step out of this church after the service and live a life which is totally different. Is it possible? Come on, I, 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 I want you to answer me. The word of God says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your spiritual worship. Now look, look at this, my dear brothers and sisters. Before I came to the word of God and before I understood the word, I played the guitar, I've sung in church choirs, I've lifted my hands and praised the Lord, I've said hallelujah, and we had a great time praising and worshiping God. But as soon as that service got over, as soon as the Eucharistic service got over, as soon as the praise and worship got over, as soon as the retreat got over, it seemed my, my, pres my, my very presence in the presence of the Lord also ceased when I went out. Because now I was not even aware of his presence within me. I was not even aware that I am supposed to die to myself. I am supposed to offer my body as a living sacrifice because worshipping the Lord is not for a period of time. It is from the moment I wake up to the time I go to bed. Now, imagine on this table right here. You have candles. You have something over there for the water for the priest to you know, during the Mass, you have a microphone, you have a tablecloth, you have got probably flowers sometimes. Now my question to you is, all those things that are lying on the table, are they things that are alive or are they things that are dead? I'm asking, are those things that are alive or are they dead? Are they physically alive or are they physically dead? No, for the moment, I'm just looking at them physically. Are they alive or are they dead? They are dead things, right? It won't move. But should I take each one of us and place ourselves on that altar? Are you going to be comfortable on that altar for a long time? I tell you for the whole service, just like in the Old Testament, they used to have a sheep or a goat or an animal and they would keep that on the altar and then it would be slaughtered. Say for example, you and I were that sacrifice and now we are kept on that altar. Would you be comfortable on that altar for a long time? Or would you roll off the altar? Come on. You know, every dead thing, every dead thing, and I give you this example of this table, I'm not saying this particular table, if we are to offer worship to the Lord, because we are living beings, won't we roll off the altar, because we want comfort, don't we want comfort, come on, anyone here, probably, you know, if, this, if these benches in the pews did not have cushions while you're kneeling down. Just for example, you do not have cushions. Maybe the heating wasn't on, the temperature outside is sub-zero. It's cold and freezing. And you don't have the heaters on here. Or say for example, you're in the Middle East, where we live for 25 years, we've been barring. And the temperatures outside are 55 degrees with 90% humidity and there's no air condition. And you've got about 1,000 people in that hall. Do you think you would be comfortable to worship God? Because we all want comfort, don't we? If we don't have comfort, we say, what's going on with the heating? Why is the air condition not on? Why is this not okay? Why are there no cushions here? Why is this not there? And why is this there? Is it possible? I'm asking you. 
And you know, my dear brothers and sisters, what I am saying is not limited to being inside the church. What I am saying is, according to this particular verse, I am on the altar of worship the moment I wake up to the time I go to bed. Every moment of my life is a life spent in worship according to this. Let me, let me, let me go further, let me go further deeper on this. See, for example, let me give you an example. You wake up in the morning with a very terrible headache. Heavy head. Has anyone woke up in the morning with a heavy head? Sure you are, with a migraine or with a heavy head. And you've got like your little children who have to go to school. You've got to prepare breakfast for them. You've got your husband probably says, you know, darling, I need to have breakfast, I need to go to work, and everyone's perfectly fine to go for their routine. You are the person who's going to prepare that breakfast. Little children who need help. Do you think you're going to stay in bed with your heavy headache? Or you're probably going to get up, take a pen and take some, some paracetamol and get onto your feet and do the job and probably look after yourself later. Is it right? You, all you mothers would know what I'm talking about. See, for example, all you mothers, when you were having your child, when you were pregnant, you're going through morning sickness, you're going through so much of pain. And then at that time, you've got an elder child or you've got some other things, some other issues of your life. Would you think this child in the womb is now, how long? It's going to be nine months. It's better I get rid of this child. I can't bear this enough. Would you ever do that? Would you ever have that thought? Never. You would never think that way. Because you're going through that. You're going through that motion. You're going through that morning sickness. You're going through that discomfort. Because you are now expecting that miracle after nine months. Even though you're going through all that discomfort. Let me give you another example. See, for example, any one of you here is a nurse. Anyone is a nurse here? Yeah. Any nurses here? No. You go to work and at the end of your shift, your boss says, your, your replacement hasn't shown up. So can you please do a second shift? And back home, you have a child of yours who's burning with a fever. But now you want to rush back and look after your own child. But your boss, the doctor says, you know what, your replacement hasn't come. There are almost about 15 patients here. I need you to stay back. I will give you not only double salary, I will give you three times the salary. Is it an issue of salary right now? When you've got a child waiting at home? No. So you do the second shift, and then at the end of second shift, exhausted you are, you go back home. Are you going to tell your little child, Mama is not well, Mama is tired, go to sleep. Will you do that? Or will you still go back and look after your child? Anybody here like that? You would look after your child. You're physically exhausted. You're tired. You're absolutely exhausted to the point where you just want to crash. But you see your child and you forget about yourself and you die to yourself. Another example. I'm just going to crank it up for you. You are the nurse. You've gone to work. You have come back and now it's your neighbor's child who is burning with the fever and the parents have gone back. The parents call you and they say, you know what, we just got a call from our little child. She's burning with the fever and you have come back from your second shift. Would you go and look after your neighbor's child? Would there be an opportunity like this? Would there be an opportunity? Not because you have slept well, not because everything is perfect with you. You have come back after the second shift, exhausted, and now it's not even your child. It is the neighbor's child you are called to look after. What would your response be? I'm presenting to you, my dear brothers and sisters, 
certain scenarios which now go to show us how you and I can be a living sacrifice. You know, we started our journey on the 23rd of February. My, my wife Melanie and myself, we started our journey on the 23rd of February from India. Then we went to one city in India. Then we went to another city in India, one week, one week, because we were doing retreats. We were doing like whole day retreats. We're doing, you know, uh, counseling, different, different sessions. Then we went, came to the UK on the 6th of March. Then we were here till about the 27th of March. Then during the Holy Week, we went to the US. Then we went to Canada. Then we came back last week from Canada. As soon as we landed from Canada, we went to Scotland. And two days ago from Scotland, we came and we landed yesterday at your church. And we have been on the move, different time zones. Sometimes we wake up at 2 in the morning and sometimes, you know, when it is afternoon, it's like maybe back home in India, they're already gone to sleep. I'm still trying to figure out which time zone I am. And when I was in the UK about two days ago, I was taking somebody's number down and I said to him, give me your number and I put plus one. He says, not plus one. Oh, I, still, I thought I'm still in Canada. And I said, plus four, four. And that was the code. So there are so many times we go through that. And yet, my dear brown sisters, when I look at that scripture, offer your body as a living sacrifice, I realize that it is His grace and because of His mercy, we can do what He has called us to do. Now, now let me even ask you further another, another thing. We turned up yesterday at your church and I know that this has been announced, the posters out there, and we were looking at the numbers here. Then I thought probably it's the first day. I thought it would be another day, we would have the second day, we would have more numbers. And you know, this morning we were here for the Eucharistic celebration at 10 o'clock with Father. It was such a wonderful, we had quite a huge crowd, I think about 30, 35 people. And I said, oh, it looks like we're going to have a lot of you this evening. But now when I see you all here, it's so encouraging, doesn't it? Isn't it so encouraging? But you know what, my dear brothers and sisters, when you learn to offer your body as a living sacrifice, you are not supposed to be looking around. You are supposed to focus on whom? On Him. Because He's the source of strength. He's the source of grace who will allow you to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Are you with me? Are you with me? So when St. Paul writes that we need to offer our body as a living sacrifice, then only those who offer this type of worship are offering worship to God that is acceptable to Him. Now again, I know when I asked you all the question, what is worship? And many of you said, praising God, thanking God, connecting with God, offering our praises to God, surrendering to God. All that is right. But if my lifestyle does not reflect this, and I only come to church as an activity to be in front of the mic to sing so that my voice is heard, and I am there in the forefront serving so that everyone will say, wow, he's doing a great job. But when I leave this place, I am not offering my body as a living sacrifice, whether it's in the church or outside the church. Am I really offering worship to the Lord that is pleasing to him when I lift up my hands and start praising him? Do you think my praises are going to the Lord? You know, I'll give you an example. You, you, you laugh at this. When I was in Bahrain, okay, without mentioning names, there used to be a particular person who used to be in the church even before the priest came in the church, even before the parish priest came. And he was the last man who went out. So everyone in the parish thought that this man really was serving in the church. Until one day, somebody inquired with him, he says, 
You know, you serve so much in the church. You're really a man who loves the Lord so much. So, he says, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I have a wife of mine at home. Who, when I'm at home, she's all the time speak, talking to me. She's all the time, you know, complaining. She's all the time, you know, like, you know, all the time she has to say something. So, I have decided to come to church as an escape route. So that I don't have to hear her complaining. I'm here in the church to serve. So I'm really happy. So I, I come to church before she wakes up and I go to, back to home by the time she's in bed. And many of us could be like those who are in the church serving, but we are escaping that place where we should be offering our body as a living sacrifice. Is anyone with me? So what is true worship? True worship is not an, it's not a breakfast, it's not a lunch, it's not a dinner, it's not like I sit for about 15-20 minutes for a cup of tea or I sit for about an hour or so for you know my lunch break, I like a like a like a like, like an aperitif or main course and a dessert and I sit in chat there and, and then it's over, then I go into the next meal after probably four or five hours. Worship isn't an activity, worship is a lifestyle. From the moment I wake up, I say to the Lord, what is it, Lord, that you want me to do? How can I be a blessing to others? Now, what I'm going to say to you, my dear brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. You know, when St. Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, you know what happens? My flesh, is going to scream. For example, if I'm not well, if I'm not well, and I still go, need to go to the kitchen, I still need to do the household chores, I still need to go to that board meeting, I still need to go to the office, because there's an important meeting today, but my health isn't good. Am I going to take it easy and go to the office and tell everybody, oh, I'm having a headache, I'm not well? You simply will go and do your job, won't you? Because you know that that board meeting is so important that's going to decide probably some better deal for you, maybe your promotion. What is my motivation to do what I'm doing? Is my motivation to see my benefit? My motivation to serve or my motivation to do anything in this life, is it limited to my benefit? then it's not offering your body as a living sacrifice. When will my worship of the activity that I do going to be true worship that is going to be pleasing to the Lord is every time I step out to do anything, I'm always looking for the benefit of others. Are you with me? I could be going to work I could be going to my board meeting. I could be going in, in terrible sickness. But then I'm going because if I miss it, I may miss my promotion. I may miss that opportunity. I may miss that opportunity for growth. I may miss that opportunity as benefits because I was not there at that right time. So I'm doing that. So what is my motivation to do what I'm doing? When my motivation to do what I'm doing is to please the Lord, to do His will and be a blessing to others, that's the time I am offering my body as a living sacrifice. That act of worship is what is pleasing to the Lord. Are you all with me? See, ultimately it is my heart condition. At the end of the day, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, if my motivation for what I'm doing is not based on what the Lord is telling me to do, then surely it is not worship. Let me give you an example. Say for example, I come to the church and I want to serve as an usher. I want to be involved you know, with all the arrangements. I want to see people are sitting properly. I want them all to, I want to serve. I want to be serving in the church. But 
my motivation to do all this is so that I am prominently seen by everybody serving. I want to be seen by the parish priest. I want Father uh, Alfred to give me a pat on the back. You want to say, hey Vincent, I'm very happy with what you're doing. Because I want that pat, I want that appreciation. Is my motivation, now on the outside, it looks good because I am serving. Even though I am doing all that, I am still helping people, I am bringing order into the church. Whenever this is the time of the Eucharist, I stand there. Yeah, please, you come in. You come in. And it looks so orderly. I am doing that service. When it comes for the collection of the money at the offertory, I am also out there with all this. I am doing that work. I am not doing, I am serving. I am serving everybody here. What is my motivation for what I am doing? What is my motivation? If I am going to sing in the church choir, I want to sing because I got a good voice. Am I singing there so that I will be in front of the mic and my voice will be heard and then people in the congregation you are looking there for some compliments from people or are you singing there because you want to give God the glory it's not about you your heart condition your motive for what you are doing is going to decide whether that activity even though it's beautiful is truly pleasing the Lord bottom line is what is my motivation for what I'm doing you know I'll give another example so that you understand what I'm saying say for example say for example you need to get some money at the end of the month your salary to pay your mortgage I know in, in this country you've got to pay your mortgage right I'm sure many of you have already paid your mortgage, you've got your own house, but there are many people who are still paying their mortgage. They're moving out, their children have grown up, now they are paying their mortgage. And at the end of the month, your company hasn't paid your salary. They are doing cost cutting. Is it possible? Just say, for example, it's possible. And you are waiting for that money plus whatever you have saved to pay the mortgage. And one of your friends comes in and says, Vincent, you know what? I'm in a big situation. I, you know, I'm, I'm living on rent. And if I don't pay my rent today, I'm going to be kicked out by the landlord. And you yourself are looking for your own salary. You're looking for that money to pay your mortgage. Because you also could be in trouble. But you have just about saving. And someone comes and shows up to you with a problem which is so critical. Would you entertain someone in such a situation? I'm giving you, I'm just giving you a, a, an example, okay? I'm giving you an example. You have a need yourself. You have a mortgage to pay. You have your own problems to deal with. Someone else has come with their problem. And now, you can answer him and say, Hey, couldn't you find somebody else? Couldn't you find other friends? Why did you come to me? I myself haven't received my salary. Whatever little saving I've got, I'm just going to put it together and pay my mortgage. And besides, you know, I'm really trying to make ends meet. And you have come to ask me a loan. I'm sorry. But it's possible for you to adjust. It's possible for you to be a living sacrifice. And it's possible for you because God sent that person in your life and made him reach to you. And now, when you get that test of offering your body as your living sacrifice, did you pass the test of worship? Did you pass that test of worship? Now, nobody knows. You can always tell that person and say, listen, you know my situation. You know that I have not got my salary. You know I have got to pay my money. You know I have got issues. But when somebody is at your door, in a crisis, would you offer your body as a living sacrifice? Forget about yourself. And put the other ahead of yourself. And be a blessing or a solution to somebody. When you begin to do that, by offering yourself,
yourself as a worship to the Lord. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God. God saw that. He accepted your worship. And you know what? God cannot be undone by a true worship done by his child. Are you listening? You know, my dear brothers and sisters, as I said to you, everything is a matter of the heart. Your motives for everything you do will not be known until the day we will be before the Lord. Right on the earth, right now as we are, we are seated here, those of us who are listening online, those of us who know about this topic, we can always show ourselves before men to be righteous. Can't we? We can show ourselves before others to be righteous. We can show ourselves before others to be somebody who is serving. We can show ourselves before others as people who are holy. But you know what? The one whose motive is right before God. Wherein they hear it from the Lord to do His will, to do His word and be a blessing to others are the ones who are truly pleasing to the Lord. Now, I want to take you to an example to show you what worship truly is. I want to take you to a Christmas story. This is a story that you always hear during the time of Christmas. It's never a reading that you ever will read in any part of the year. It's always the Christmas story. But we have to go back to that in order to know what worship is. Are you all ready? Are you ready to get Christmas come earlier before than and usual? And again, and again, I'm not saying that it is, a, it is a reading appropriate for Christmas because it never happened during the time of Jesus. It never happened during the birth of Jesus. It happened much later. You will see that later. So let's go to Matthew chapter 2 and let's begin with verse number 1. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now, we are going to learn about worship. This example, this passage is going to show us true worshippers. Okay? And we'll see why they are true worshippers. Okay, let's go on. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Please highlight that. We are come to worship him. My question to each one of you, look on the screen. I want to know between verse number one and verse number two, what is the time span? Give it a guess. Look at verse number one and look at verse number two. And I want you to tell me the approximate time span. What does it start with? It starts with the birth of Jesus, correct? When, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. My question to each one of you is, in the verse 1 itself, can anyone tell me what is the time span? Anybody? Okay, let me put it differently. When did the wise man come to Bethlehem? I mean to Jerusalem? When did they come? When did they come to Jerusalem? When did the wise men come to Jerusalem? When Jesus was born. My question to you is, did they arrive Jerusalem? How did they come to Jerusalem? How did, what, what made them come to Jerusalem? From where did they come? They saw the star. It was their GPS. When did the star appear? When Jesus was born, the star appeared in the sky. So, 
they had to first see the star in the sky. Listen very carefully. I want you to pay attention. They saw the star in the sky which appeared when Jesus was born. Is that right? When they saw the star, where were they? Sorry? No. The word of God says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, behold, there came wise men from the from the east. Where do you think these wise men came from? From east of Jerusalem? Asia. Where do you think they came from? Give me a place where they came from. They came from Babylon. They came from Persia. They were Persians. They were not J Jews. Now I want to ask you, they saw the star in Babylon, in Persia, when Jesus appeared. How long would it take for them to reach from Persia to Jerusalem? Number one, there were no airplanes, there were no buses, there were no trains, there were no cars, there were only camels. There were no roads, there were terrains, mountains, there were no hotels, there was no internet, there was hot and cold. How long do you think it took the wise men who saw the star in the east in Babylon to actually make a journey to reach Jerusalem? Can you guess? You need to see your maps. If you know your geography, Babylon is close to 1800 kilometers to 1000 kilometers from Jerusalem. The star appeared when? When Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, I want to ask you all, would you look up into the sky and see a star and make a decision to go to the Holy Land? Has anybody ever made a decision by looking at a, at a star in the sky, even if you were studying the stars, would you make a decision to just say, okay, now I know it's, it, it, I, I'm living in the times of Jesus, I'm, uh, there's, no G, there's no internet, there is no GPS, there is nothing, no satellite there. I see a star, now I need to follow that star. Because I want to go and worship the King of Kings. How do I get this thing in my mind? Would you ever not ask this question? Has anybody asked this question? I think I'm just stuck on one verse number one. I think I will not go further than verse number one today. Now my question to you is, you know, when I was reading the scripture, I got stuck on the scripture for probably weeks on end, on just this verse one. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, how come wise men from the east, wise men from Babylon, wise men from Persia, who don't even know that there is a king of kings and lord of lords born, who have no idea of scriptures, who don't know that the Messiah is coming, just looking at a star, how could they make a journey close to 20 to 22 months to reach in order to only worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What does verse 2 say? They come now to Jerusalem. Let me tell you. Let me tell you the answer. And again, this is what I, 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 I you know, through the time of, you know, asking the Holy Spirit and reflecting on this, this is what I came to know. Now you won't read all this in that one verse. Because you really need to ask the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher, isn't it? Come on. When those men saw the star in the east, in Babylon, they were the ones who were studying the stars. Okay? They were studying the stars. So they knew what stars were in the sky. It's like, you know, 
like how we have people who study the, the, the stars today, they study, they know exactly when there's going to be a solar eclipse like the one that we had this month. Remember, NASA was, was showing it live. Probably in the UK, you would not have, but when we were in Canada, we actually saw that. We, we, we saw 75% of it, but we were not in that exact line. But they knew exactly what time, what moment, which state, which country, because they are so having all those details. But during those years, 2,000 years ago, for those guys to know about the stars, obviously they would have done a lot of study. So they knew that that star that appeared was not a star that they knew anything about. But you know what? I asked the Holy Spirit, okay, if they did not knew, know what the star was, what would make them look at that star and make a decision to follow that star and say, we want to go and follow that star to reach a king of kings and the lord of lords to worship him. What would make them do that? So obviously there would have to be some divine intervention. So I began to ask the Holy Spirit, I began to reflect on that. And the Lord said, you know, he says, many centuries before, there was a king of Persia by the name of Nabuchadnezzar. And Nabuchadnezzar had picked up a lot of Jews who were very intelligent, which you will read about, Sadraj, Mesaj, Abednego, Daniel. So all of them were taken as captives and now given very good positions in the, in the kingdom of the Persians in Babylon. And it was in this place that Daniel had written the prophecies of the coming Messiah. That's not all. You know, you don't just want to get information. You want to know much more. And so I'm asking the Holy Spirit, please help me to get more. Even if they knew that there was a Messiah to be born, what would ever make them connect that star in the east and knowing that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born to put the two together? You had to obviously have divine intervention. And you know, my dear brothers and sisters, those people, apart from studying the stars, were also reading the scriptures. They were also reading the scriptures. Anybody who's studying the word of God, anybody who's spending time with scriptures, is in touch with whom? Is in touch with whom? If you are spending time in your day, reading those scriptures, reflecting on the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, trying to get understanding of the scriptures. Who are you in touch with? You are in the very presence of God. It is the Holy Spirit who is communicating with you. Now, on the other hand, look at the people in Israel. They had prophecies written down by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Malachi. All those prophets have written that there is a Messiah coming. Is it right? Every Sabbath day, they are reading scriptures about the coming Messiah. They are waiting with expectation. But when the Messiah has already come, when the man who is supposed to herald the coming of the Messiah, he also has come. They don't even know that the Messiah has already born on their soil. Are you listening? Are you listening, my dear brothers and sisters? How many Sundays and how many days of the week sometimes some of us who come from Masdi are reading the scriptures every day? The first reading, the psalm, if it is Sunday, the second reading, the gospel reading. And how many of us are getting deeper revelations from the Holy Spirit? Or are we hearing it in one year, throwing it out from the other, and we have no revelation from the Holy Spirit. Is it possible? And the people of Babylon who see a star in the sky, a star that is unusual, what happens? They are able to connect the advent of that star with the scriptures that they have been studying. And the Holy Spirit says, boom, that star is your indicator that star is your GPS 
which is going to take you to the place where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is born. Follow that star to offer him homage, to offer him worship. My question to each one of you, my dear brothers and sisters is, when they made that decision, did they have any idea how long it's going to take? Did they have any idea what troubles they're going to face? Did they have any idea what dangers they would face? And most importantly, listen to this. When you see a star in the sky, when are you going to see it? During the day or during the night? So if you have to look at the star and make your journey, when are you going to start journey? During the day? Night time. Is that right? There are no street lights. There are ravens, terrains. There are no proper roads. There's no street lighting. There could be animals on the way. It could be cold. It could be freezing because the terrain between Babylon and is absolutely treacherous. But they are looking at that star. They are looking at the GPS. Their focus is not only on that star. Their focus is on the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings whom they are setting out to worship. When do you think their worship began? When they reached there? When did their worship begin? Their worship began the moment they stepped out of Babylon, looked at that star, made whatever preparation they had, whether it was good or not. They had to find food for their camels. They had to find food for themselves. They may probably have run out of food. They might clothes must have been probably in the soil. They might have probably never taken a shower or a bath for months on end. They must have been probably having beards touching the, touch, touching the floor. You may probably have found them going through so much of dangers because they are now, you know, it's not a short journey, it's not months, it's probably about 18 to 20 months. It's not on good roads. And now they don't look back. They look at that star. And looking at that star, they progress on that journey. They die to themselves. They are offering up their bodies as a living sacrifice with only one goal to reach that place where the star is going to stop and show them where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is born. Now look at verse number two. Having seen that star, having seen that star, it was their GPS, they have done this journey by night over so many months. And, and you know, Again, many of you will say, how did you come with a figure of 20 months or 22 months? Isn't that an obvious question? When you look at, as you go further down, what happens? Again, you know, because of the time frame, I can't go verse to verse. So I'm going to, I'm going to quickly pick the important things in these verses. And you can read that for your homework, okay? You can read that for your homework. But I'm going to explain it to you. Those wise men, and again, they're not, they not limiting them to three because, you know, they gave them gold, frankincense and myrrh. And that's why we call them three wise men. They could have been probably 20, they could have been 25, they could have been a big troop in their caravan. But the point is, these men looked at a star and came all the way to Jerusalem because that's the point where the star brought them. And you know what happened? When the star came into Jerusalem, the star went off the radar. All along, between Babylon in the east, they were looking at a star, they were looking up, and they were following that star, and they were, that they were approaching the place where they were brought to Jerusalem. Are you listening? When they come to verse number two, we see, they have landed into Jerusalem, which means they were looking upwards in order to let that star bring them to that point. But when they reached Jerusalem, 
the star goes off the radar so instead of looking up now where are they looking they are looking down are you all with me are you all with me see at this point in time up to jerusalem now you, now what i'm saying to you is based on scripture i'm not inventing anything you may be wondering how come you you say this as we go further you will realize what i'm saying that's why i'm saying i'll, I'll tell you that later so they look at the star they look at the gps the gps is bringing them now to jerusalem when they reach jerusalem the star which is their gps goes off the radar they now look down and when they reach jerusalem in verse number 2 they come to the town square and they begin to ask people where is the king of kings where is the king to be born born are you listening listen listen to this they set out from their journey from babylon looking at a star they are coming to a place where the king of kings and the lord of lords is born now they come to the town square and they ask the people where is the king to be born born that's what it says saying where is he was to where is he that is born king of the jews for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him they are very clear for why they have come to worship the king look at verse 3 when herod let's go a little bit on top let's raise it on top please when herod the king had heard these things he was troubled and all jerusalem with him let me ask you let me ask you you working in a place for 20 years and one fine day your boss says you know vincent i brought this new man to you please train him because he is there to help you to assist you because you have been a senior person in this company and you know we realize you are loaded with so much of work and this man is come to help you and he is well versed with computers you are a little bit outdated but please show him everything and he leaves him with you what's going to go on in your mind sorry he is come to take my my place so you are going to be extremely careful to show him everything that you have learned and the boss at the end of one week says how is the man doing oh he is a nut case he is a nut he may be very good why should he be a nut because if he is doing the job the next question the boss is going to say you know i have a special i want to talk to you it's been a long time you have worked with us and we want to thank you for your service here's your here's your benefits thank you very much we have this job taken by a new man because he knows the computers he knows the job and he is going to take your place is that right now if you know this will you be very secure if herod who is the king of of israel comes to know from some strangers that there is a king born is 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 a king is born for what so there can be two kings or he's going to take over his place come on come on someone's come to take his place what do you think is going to be very comfortable is going to be extremely insecure and herod is a very insecure secure man if he has a duty to read this about the history of the king if herod knows that anybody is going to be there to take his place because he was ruthless he's going to bring his soldiers into the house and he's going to search the house he's going to destroy people so when people of jerusalem hear that a king is born herod is troubled herod is troubled and why are the people troubled because their king is going to ruthlessly search their homes to find out where this new king is hiding are you all with me see i'm sure we have read this scripture so many times but we would not have reflected on so many of these things right have we 
The word of God says in verse 3, when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. He has heard it from town square. Somebody comes and asks somebody in the town square. You know, I don't know how it is in the UK, in the villages, but in India, you know, being a much rural place, if you've got a, if you've got a small village, somebody comes there, and I'm talking about during my childhood days when there was no internet. Do you know that the town square where people gathered together was the local BBC and the CNN? My sister said, yes, I know what you're talking about. You just have to come there and they are like, anybody passing by, any new person has come, immediately by the word of mouth, the word has spread. And, and, and BBC and CNN is not reliable there because what happened here may be something by the time the news has reached to another end, it's like Chinese whispers. Are you with me? But on this occasion, when those men come there, the word reaches the palace of Herod that a king is born and some crazy guys with long beards looking absolutely awesome and looking so horrible are now come in the town square looking to worship a king and they have come and are asking where this king is born. News reaches the palace. Verse number two, four. And when he, that who Herod had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Ha ha! The people of Jerusalem, the, the Jews who have been going every Sabbath to the church, to the, to the synagogue, they don't know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to be close to two years. They don't even know he's come. But they have to go to the scriptures to find out that he's going to be born. And what do they find out? And they said unto him, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Behold, Herod has got it confirmed that these guys are not fools. These guys are not jokers. These guys are not come to pass time. They are spot on because it is written in the scriptures that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now listen to this. Now listen to this. What was the state of affairs of these people who had left Babylon? Were they presentable? Do you think they were presentable? You know, for all you know, I was trying to imagine how they would have looked like. They would have had long beards, their hair must have grown so big, their nails must have grown big. They must have been smelling and stinking. They must have, their shoes must have gone, their camels must be, must be, they must be, you know, must be looking very pathetic. They must have not eaten food for days together. They are rough and tough and gone through all this terrain. And they are in a state of, they are in such a miserable state. But now, look at what it says. Can we go, go further to verse 7? I don't want to go all in detail. So they tell him about In verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now let me ask you, if Herod is going to call these men to see them, he wants to see them in this state? If he's the king and they are smelling and they are looking so miserable, he would have called the tailor and said, I want them to have new clothes. He would have called his barber and told them, give them a haircut, give them a nice shave, put them nice, probably old spice perfume, get them new shoes, give them good food to eat for about three, four days, make them presentable and only then bring them in my presence. Are you listening? Are you listening, my dear brother? And why has he to do that? He has to extract information from them. Do you think if he's going to bring them in that state, would they ever want to tell anything to the king? Not at all. You know, in verse 7, Herod called them privately. He doesn't want to make a big noise. He calls them privately. So when he calls them privately, he meets all their needs. Let me ask, let me tell you something. You will be very happy to know one thing. I told you who is a true worshipper? 
the one who offers his body as a living sacrifice. Remember, we started in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. When you begin to offer worship like that, you will get access into high places and all your needs will be met. Are you listening? I don't know whether you are listening what I'm saying. Nobody knows what pain and trouble they have taken. Nobody knows the sacrifice that they have made. But the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings has seen how they have offered their bodies as a living sacrifice. Looking at a star, spending sleepless nights looking at a star to reach where they are. They are in a horrible state to even enter the presence of the King of Kings. But the King of this earth prepares them, gives them new clothes. You know, the Holy Spirit, is, when He teaches you like this, you will imagine how it is. It's not all written there. You need to get it from the Holy Spirit. And what He's telling you and me today is, when you begin to be a worshiper like that, who's offering worship to the Lord by offering your body as a living sacrifice, People can criticize you. People can say any number of things of you. But when your motive is right and your intentions are right and your heart condition is right and you are going to do the will of the Father and be a blessing to others, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings has seen it. He will give you access to high places. Every need of yours shall be met. Amen. Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. Where is he sending them? Why is he sending them to Bethlehem? Because, why is he sending them to Bethlehem? Go back, go back a little bit. Look at verse number 6. And thou Bethlehem, in verse 5, and they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. I want to ask you, did Herod know that he was born in Bethlehem? Yes. Because he was told by the priest, he was told by that. So when he is going to send them, where is he going to send them? To Bethlehem. And why is he sending them to Bethlehem? Because he wants to get information from them. Because he says, go further up, go further up. And he sent them, verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child and when did he say, go to Bethlehem and, and, and search for the little baby? And you know, my dear brothers and sisters, because of verse number 8, we still keep the wise men in our crib during Christmas. Because we still believe after 18 months, Jesus is still in the manger. How many of you have made a crib at home during Christmas? How many of you have kept the three wise men there in the crib? You have, but they were never. In the, they never came to the crib. Jesus was close to two years. Okay, we 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 talk about that in case we have time. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, "Go and search diligently for the young child, because he had found out all the information. He had come to know how many months it has taken them, so he knows that this, this is not a little baby anymore. He's already a child now." diligently for the young child and when you have found him bring me word again that I may come and worship him also liar you can step out of your house and say I'm coming to the church for the mass I'm going to worship the Lord don't you ever say that if your lifestyle is not a lifestyle of offering your body as a living sacrifice. Are 
share with me, my dear brothers and sisters. We could come to the church for the mass, for the novena, for anything. But if my lifestyle is not a lifestyle where I am offering my body as a living sacrifice, I am exactly like this Herod who wants to go and offer worship to the Lord. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You know, before I go further, I told you earlier, they looked at a star looking upwards. When they reached Jerusalem, the star disappeared for a while. Their gaze from upwards became downwards because God wanted these two worshippers to be heralds of the good news to the people of Jerusalem. Now they knew, now the king knew, now those people in the town scare knew, something has happened. The king is born, the Messiah has arrived. Are you with me? They departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east when before them till it came and stood over the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. The star they looked, but that star had gone off the radar so that God wanted them to be heralds now to give the good news. Now they have been prepared by the king. They have been given new clothes. They have been given, you know, McDonald delivery also for the way. They have been given food for their camels. They have been given new shoes. They have been given a set of extra clothes. But not because they are going to give information. They have been prepared by the Creator. Because now they are going to be in the presence of the King of Kings in proper attire. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you with me, my dear brothers and sisters? Their heart condition was right, but their external was not right. But God put them in charge of the palace, brought them to Herod. They had the attire down. Their heart was right. Their inner condition was right. And now they were in a perfect disposition to offer the Lord King of Kings the worship that is true to his name. It's not enough. It's not enough for my heart to be right. What is important is even my external attire. If I am not coming with modest clothes to worship the Lord, my clothing is a distraction to others. I am dishonoring the Lord. Are you with me? If I am, like for the women, they come with revealing clothes. I come like a man with all my tattoos. I'm going to show my body. I'm going to show them. Everyone is looking at my body. The women are wearing sick clothes which are all revealing instead of looking and focusing on that worship everyone's looking around there what's going on my heart condition will be right if my heart condition is right even my external attire will be appropriate not only when I come to church 24-7 because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit I am not come to do a worship in the church as an activity. My entire disposition 24-7 reflects the presence of this God inside of me. My attire, the way I dress, the way I speak, the way I conduct myself reflects the presence of my God on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. I told you, the star appeared. It went off the radar. God wanted these men, instead of looking upwards, to look down and announce the good news to, to Herod. Announce the good news to the people. At the same time, get the benefits of being prepared to worship the King of Kings. Now, they have been sent to go to Bethlehem but the star is not taking them to Bethlehem. 
The star is taking them somewhere else. Look at what it says. And when they came into the manger, did they come into the manger? And when, verse 11, and when they would come into the, into the house in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. And when they would come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother. What about the father, Joseph? Why isn't Joseph mentioned here? He's working. Praise God. Beautiful. Thank you, sister. Perfect. Spot on. With, his, with Mary, his mother. Otherwise, if he had to come to the manger, he also would have been there. In the manger, Joseph also would have been there. With Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now listen everybody. This was not the worship that they had only given only. Their worship started when they left Babylon. This was like the icing on the cake. This was like putting the cherry on top of the pudding. The worship was not just the offering of gold, frankincense and myrrh. The worship is not when I come to church for that one hour Eucharistic celebration. The worship is not when I come to church and sing some songs. The worship is not when I put my hands and start praising God. The worship is not when I sing loudly and I say hallelujah. My worship is a lifestyle. And when I offer a lifestyle, when I offer my body as a living sacrifice and I now come to the church as brothers and sisters and lift up my hands, those holy hands which I'm lifting up and singing, maybe I'm not singing a soprano, I'm not singing an alto, I'm not speaking, singing any, any of the voices, I'm probably out of tune, but my God is listening to every word that I'm singing because now when I open my mouth to offer in worship, it is a sweet sound to the ears of my Creator. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So you know, my dear brothers and sisters, when you and I become the people God wants us to be by offering our body as a living sacrifice, I look for opportunities to hear the word of God, what he has said in his word, in order to Obey that word and be a blessing to somebody. God saw it and that worship became acceptable to him. And when the worship is acceptable to him, what happens? Do you think when you worship the Lord that way, will you ever have sickness in your body? Will you have any lack in your life? Will you have problems in your marriage? Will you have problems in your family? Will the solar eclipse or the infrared rays or the ultrasound rays affect you? Will GM food affect you? That you have to go and search for only organic food? I'm asking you. The presence of God will envelop you because you are offering in that worship. You are in the presence of the Lord. You don't visit the presence of the Lord. You are not just going there just to make a visit. You are living in the presence of God 24-7. And when you live like that, by offering your body as a living sacrifice, you begin to see God's glory every moment of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, many of us, we Catholics, we have sometimes been deceived because we think if we don't miss our obligation mass on Sunday, or if we don't miss our rosary in the evening, or we don't miss our time of prayer, we probably will be offending the Lord. But you know what? 
There may be times you may have even missed your Sunday Mass because on your way to Sunday Mass you saw someone on the streets who had an accident was bleeding there and you were that good Samaritan whom the Lord put in the path of that way and instead of going there to offer worship you died to yourself soiled your hands and offered some help to that person and saved the life and God saw it maybe the pastor will not see you in the church that day maybe your family said what happened to you we were all at the mass and you were not did not come but God saw it you died to yourself that worship of the Lord was pleasing to him Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if we are going to have this mindset, we are going to start reflecting on what we heard today. If we are really going to start being the worshippers that we are called to be, it's not going to happen in a day because you heard the session today. Your flesh is going to scream. We have got what is called as our spirit man and our carnal man. Our flesh and our spirit. The spirit man wants to go the things of God but the carnal man, our flesh, says no, it's very cozy in my bed. I don't want to get up. When somebody comes to me for help, take me to the hospital. Oh, I have a headache today. You invent a headache. But when I offer my body as a living sacrifice, whether I've got a headache, whether I've slept for two hours, whether I slept just two hours before, maybe I slept at four in the morning, and I have to wake up at six to take a neighbor to the hospital because I got an SOS call, I will wake up and offer my body as a living sacrifice. Nobody knows you slept for two hours. You don't even have to tell somebody that you woke, you slept only two hours before. But God saw it. That worship was acceptable to him. He is going to glorify you. You will see that no lack ever will come in your life. Every moment will be a moment of joy. His grace will kick in and you will see every moment of your life will be a blessing to those around you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just close our eyes. Loving Father, you are such an awesome God. You are a holy God. And yet, Father, you chose to dwell inside human beings. You gave us your spirit and we blew it all up in the Garden of Eden. But you did not stop. You sent your son to be our substitute. And Jesus, when you walked on this earth, you offered your body as a living sacrifice. Jesus, you even said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That is how, Lord, in the short time that you were there, you offered your body as a living sacrifice to do the will of your Father and to be a blessing to everyone that came in your path. The lame walked. The blind saw, the deaf were able to hear, the dead were raised, the lame walked, the hungry were fed, because you chose to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Today, Father, to us believing in your Son, Jesus, you have given us your spirit. You have given us, you have restored our relationship back to you. You have made us sons and daughters in your kingdom. <coughs> and it is through the Holy Spirit that we can now have fellowship and intimacy with you. 
Father, let your spirit direct us to spend time with your word, to study your word, to reflect on your word, and most importantly, to be doers of your word. Your word says in James chapter 1 verse 22, do not be deceived. Do not be just hearers, but be doers of the word. We have been deceived for too long. We have been deceived by religion. We have been deceived by so many things because we have not known the truth. But today, you have shown us, Lord, <coughs> what true worship really is. You have shown us, Lord, that through the power of your Holy Spirit inside of us, we can offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Help us, Lord, to study your word, to reflect on it, and to do your word, no matter what, no matter whatever time you call us to do it. So that as we do your word, we can be a blessing to our brothers and sisters. We can be a blessing to our neighbors. We can be the good Samaritans to anyone you send in our path. Father, tonight, as we leave this place, help us, Lord, to reflect on all that we learned today. And help us, Lord, to put this into practice, to continually search our hearts, Search our motives in what we do and how we do so that everything that we offer to you may come to your throne of grace and be a sweet smelling offering to your nostrils and a sweet sound to your ears as we offer you our worship by offering ourselves, our bodies as a living sacrifice. Tonight as we go home, our test is already begun. Our test has already begun as we step out of the door of this church. We will experience these opportunities to die to ourselves. We will have opportunities in our own homes to die to ourselves. And help us Lord, with your grace, to put into practice and offer you the worship pleasing to your holy name. We thank you, we praise you, we bless you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.